Can people hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to start this by acknowledging that we're sitting in a structure built without consent on the land and lives of Wiradjuri people of the Kulin Nations, and I pay my respect to their elders past and present. And I pay my respect to the First Nations folks here tonight, and I also pay respect to the trans and gender diverse people here tonight, for whom public transport, sitting in a crowd, or going to pee, are alienating and sometimes dangerous experiences. I acknowledge the people who did not come this evening and recognize that invisibility is a safe space when you move through climates of surveillance. I'd also like to acknowledge my respect for the many people who form my artistic lineage, not least my deceased father, grandfather, and godparents. I don't have time to speak on the many people who have helped me to outgrow myself. There are many to whom I am indebted and I aspire to being as generous as the people who have taught me. The three artists who I will share with you have very differing practices from each other. The common thread is that each artist has created a way to make work which diverges from the mainstream concept, concept of giving visual evidence of queerness. Each artist has their own theoretical and material methodology to achieve this. In 2016, I was 26 years old. I was in my first year of masters. I was very depressed. I was living in an estrogen body and still choosing to give performances, which called for crowds of people to um, observe my body in that cold, ruminative, art gaze way. I don't know why I did it. <laughs> um, one of my coping strategies during that time was research listening to artist talks, mostly lying down in the dark, trying to piece together a cartography in my head of the ways that gender non-conforming subjectivities are being shared, understood and misunderstood within larger art institutes. Gordon Hall. I sometimes wonder about this kind of obsession with trans people's bodies and trans people's transitions. And, and one explanation would be something like, oh, this is weird and different, so I'm interested in it. But another explanation, which actually feels more right to me, <laughs> is that everybody transitioned. Everybody is transitioning. Like, you went through puberty. You became a woman or a man. You were pregnant. You are getting old and dying. Your body is in a constant state of transition. And there are some people who embody that very human mode of transitionality in a sort of uh, crystallized way or an accelerated way, and that often is transgender people. Um, and for me, one of the sort of ways of trying to, to maneuver around this historical problem of imaging the trans body is to think about abstraction as a possible way of you know, uh, having a body or being a body without necessarily showing a body. Like, where is my body when my body doesn't show up as an image for you? Or uh, how can my body speak in a language that doesn't exist yet? Which abstraction feels like a way, I mean, abstraction is an extremely general term, but, you know, um, non-representational ways of making, you know, sense that doesn't make sense yet. You know, uh, having, having a body, body or being, being a body, body without necessarily showing a body. body. Having a body or being a body without necessarily showing a body. Having a body or being a body without necessarily showing a body. Like, like where is my body when my body doesn't show up? Like, where is my body when my body doesn't show up? Like, like, where, where is, is my body, body when my body, body doesn't, doesn't show up as, as an, an image, image for, for you? you. Or, or um, uh, how, can how can my body speak? 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 How can my body speak in a language that doesn't exist yet? Which abstraction feels like a way. I mean, abstraction is an extremely general term, but, you know, um, non-representational non ways of making force. 
Gordon Hall is a New York-based sculptor, writer, performance artist and lecturer at Parsons and the New School. I first came across their work listening to this panel discussion when Gordon said, how can my make... How can my body speak in a language that doesn't exist yet? It seemed like such a concise description of my own performance practice that I knew that I wanted to know Gordon. After emailing them out of the blue, they warmly replied and agreed to mentor me. So for the past year, we've been Skyping roughly once a month, uh, which has been possible through the Midsummer Futures Mentorship Program, which I recommend to any emerging queer artists here. Um, We talk about new work. We talk about how to have an art practice and a life at the same time. We also talk a lot about talking. We talk about language, the way that words solidify experiences and are also incomplete. I want gender to be a noun, not... Oh, sorry. (laughs) Back to front. I want gender to be a verb, not a noun. A thing that gets done and undone. Our work is visually very different. Their interest lies predominantly in abstract sculpture. Mine lies in self-portraiture. The commonality between us is an interest in using words in ways that might fracture fracture reductive readings of our work. And more importantly, we work to fracture the English language, which plays an important role in the governance of gender identity. We both recognise that the history of imaging trans bodies has been a coercive and pathologizing history. Gordon's way out of that history is through the visual language of abstraction, which allows them to invest queer meanings into objects through intimate backstories, often woven into the text pieces that accompany their installations. My way out of that history is by showing up and trying to abstract this body with words and actions that are partially incomprehensible. Gordon says, what happens when my body doesn't show up as an image for you? In performance, I try and show up and become an image that cannot be read. An image that retains a lot of secrecy or pulls together so many disparate readings that it doesn't sit coherently. Abstract sculpture leaves me feeling cold, but I love that it can do that. And there needs to be space for queer practices that do not visually register as, as queer away from the otherwise immediately classifiable tropes of drag and camp, which become ghettoized and monetized so quickly. I love that intimate stories about queer lives and desires can be embedded in a concrete and steel thing without its audience knowing it. This creates a kind of opacity, or a sovereignty that refuses to be easily digestible to audiences. How to evade definition but not avoid my body invoking a voice without its speaker and practicing opacity. Juliana Huxtable. Forcing all artwork that engages in questions that could be, you know, let's, I hate this term, but for the purposes of this conversation and not going on for like five minutes, let's just say identity, questions of identity, work that engages that. I think it's really irresponsible. And I think ultimately in the long run, it's actually just like kills the sort of dynamism of the work to try and hold it to those standards. There are people who take that out initially, and I think that's each artist's sort of initiative, but to hold every single artist up who's a woman or trans or black to an agenda is really unfair and will ultimately only serve to have their work excluded from the canon because I think people saying that and dictating and placing that responsibility is what was allowed, is what allowed so many artists making really important dynamic work in the like 90s and 2000s to be historicized as identity politics and then you have a bunch of young artists now trying to make work and they literally, it's like they can't get out of those conversations because it's like written off and the failure of those, what the presumed political demands of that work then becomes a burden that they have to somehow overcome, which is why I personally feel so frustrated in trying to navigate questions of like black identity, et cetera, et cetera. So while I think that is an important question I think making that the primary question through which you look at this sort of work is really problematic and does a really, 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 really large disservice to the artist and how their work is allowed to exist in conversation with, like, institutions. 
and they literally, literally it's, it's like, like they, they can't, can't get, get out of those conversations, conversations and they literally it's, it's like, like they, they can't, can't get out of those conversations, conversations and, and they literally it's, it's like, like they can't, can't get out of those conversations and they literally it's like they can't get out of those conversations and they literally it's like they can't get out of those conversations and they literally it's like they can't get out of those conversations kills the sort, the sort of dynamism of the work to try and hold it to those standards kills 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 the sort of dynamism of the work to try and hold I'm it to those standards Juliana Huxtable is a New York based poet DJ and artist her description of the cultural shift that was identity politics and its legacy which she describes as presumed political demands that young artists are now faced with mediating whenever their practice evokes something to do with having a body helped me to understand how what I do is received by others. Juliana says that this unsolicited placement of a political agenda onto artworks made by anyone from a marginalized background kills the potency and the agency of the work, limiting how it lives on in writing and in curation. This strikes an immediate chord with my experience. The presumption is always that my work is about gender and that my work should be legibly transgender or that my difference should be visible in my work and say something on behalf of people who are similarly different. Actually, as time goes on, I come to realize that my work is just silly <laughs> and weird and mostly about trying to make friends with myself or with other people. Juliana Huxtable brought me to the question, how can I make artwork from my subjectivity after identity politics and not get rele relegated into the tight phrase transgender artist and whatever that means to the cis hetero art world? Last year I sat in my studio at the VCA on the phone with a producer who wanted to make a short doco for the ABC about artists from various marginalized backgrounds. There would be an episode about an indigenous painter, an episode about a deaf dancer, a refugee sculptor, and I would be the trans performance artist. He asked about my work, my life, trying to see if I could fit. At some point he asked, oh, so is it possible to be transgender and not change your body? Earlier in this panel discussion, Juliana Huxtable remarked that being recognized as trans does not equate to having the kind of affect, power, or access to resources that the term recognition would usually be understood to result in. What do we do when the people curating how we are represented on national platforms do us injustice, not because they dislike us, but because they actually do not? know us or understand us. Last year, Juliana Huxtable DJed in Melbourne at the Night Cat for Spank, which is a queer club night organized by the Melbourne DJ, Brooke Powers. I was there with my best friend, a friend from uni and one of my teachers. I wore a foosball team and some shorts. I met a cute person and she is now my very queer and beautiful boyfriend. I love repeating the phrase, she is my boyfriend to myself, because it merges two discrete ideas of doing and being together, which erases the cis-heteronormative system of relating. Or to put it another way, the phrase, she is my boyfriend, is a way to deny presumed politicized demands around our bodies. Wu Tsang. I'm also very, in, I have always been very involved in, I guess, like, I would say, like, underground culture, like, subculture, like, very involved with, like, music and, um, like, DJs and club culture. And when I started making art, I was actually just making art about what I was excited about. And I was very surprised when it started to interact with, like, the larger art world, because this, I, this phrase, identity politics, came up a lot with my work. And I was never totally understanding it because I was like, well, I'm just making work about about me and my friends and the things that I'm interested in and who I am. For some reason, it's that thing you were saying, like people are like, oh, well, you're transgender, so your work must be about being transgender or something like that. And so I really was very like reticent to engage in that way. Although I think like nowadays I'm 
I'm much more interested in the subject matter. Um, mostly my work is, uh, I work as a performer and a filmmaker and my work is generally very like durational based or like installation based. So it's really hard to represent with images, but or, or with still images, but um, oh, I forgot what I was gonna say. What were we talking about? <laughs> Underground culture, like subculture, like 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 Wu Tsang is an artist originally from LA who makes work internationally. Wu Tsang's work is, as she says, about her life and what she's interested in. Earlier in this particular talk, she reflected on her involvement in feminist and queer activist circles as formative in her coming of age, which feeds into her art practice. Hearing another artist owning their autobiography in tandem with asserting that their work is interesting because it is interesting, not because of the currency of their gender identity, served to be a very powerful example for me when I was still in my art school egg. Learning to own my autobiography and writing and visual work is a continual process of addition and subtraction. How much privacy do I want to renounce? And at what point does exposure make you feel less whole? Wu Tsang's lived experience within countercultural spaces surfaces in her practice through works like her feature film Wildness. The film is a story about the shifting ecology of an established LA bar called the Silver Platter and how that changed once Wu Tsang began hosting the queer nightclub Wildness at the bar. Narrated in Spanish by the Silver Platter, the film merges documentary with fiction and describes human experience from an imaginative non-human paradigm, one larger and longer than a human life, an architectural paradigm, a safe space turned violent, a beacon and a nightclub. I can relate to this practice of propagating alternate lenses from which to look at the world. This comes partly from growing up with Scientologists on one side of my family and School of Philosophy members on the other. It comes from learning a dead language in primary school, and it comes from being taught how to meditate when I was five. I spent my teenage years on the periphery of the Sydney punk music scene. I spent some time homeless, and I spent time in various political and spiritual communities. My as yet unedited work, 30 Nights with Strangers, was filmed in 2015 and is literally what the title implies. These experiences interfacing with alternate communities are formative of my desire to find other kinds of logic, new ways to value being alive, which are not limited to the binary logic of a two-gender system. Making artwork is the same thing as making myself, which is the same thing as making a world where that self is not an anomaly. On that note, I would like to end by sharing that for the past five months, I've been working on an important series of artworks that serve to abstract this body, that meld definitions through actions and expose the tension between privacy and publicity that trans people often experience. These artworks are for sale on an online fundraiser, which will help me to afford surgery. So if you are interested in looking at them or buying them, you can find them by looking at my Instagram, which is Archie Full Stop Barry, with the link in my bio. I want to finish by saying that I'm very grateful to these artists who I have referenced this evening for their words and their work and for making emancipatory paradigms visible to me in the dark, lying down with headphones. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.